truck up here every every summer uh, that, that all you Coloradans are, are honking at and, and, uh, and, and yelling at, getting mad. We, we at least don't bring ATVs. Uh, that, that's the one redeemable part uh, of our family uh, pilgrimage every summer. Well, good to be with you. Hunger Free Colorado is in the work that you do as partner organizations. You really are the best in the business. Um, so it's ironic that I'm coming here to speak to you. Really, you all just need to come down to Texas and tell us how to do it. The success that you've had over the past 10 years is remarkable. Uh, Kathy and I both started, I started THI at the same time that she started Hunger Free Colorado. And so we quickly became friends and would text each other back and forth. And I was, I was always rooting for Kathy to come up with good ideas so that we could steal them and implement them in Texas. <laughs> and uh, and uh, so we're very grateful for the great ideas that you come up with. If y'all could come up with a few more, uh, particularly around the legislative session, that would be very helpful uh, so that we can also try that in Texas. Uh, well, well, it's good to be with you. I want to tell you a little bit of, uh, um, I'm going to hand it to Dan. tell you a little bit about an experience I had a few years ago when Congress established the National Commission on Hunger. Uh, the Commission uh, was tasked with trying to find ways that the United States could more effectively address hunger and I was lucky enough to be a part of it. In order to best understand the issue, we traveled to communities across the country to try to hear directly from the people. One trip took us to the West Texas desert where we sat down with a group of elders who met each other in a citizenship class. Most of them had lived and worked in the United States their entire lives. They raised their children here, many of whom had enlisted to serve in the military and were in the Middle East on active duty as we spoke. They were not rapists or drug smugglers. They had been business owners, welders, car mechanics, and their one wish was to die U.S. citizens. Along with their desire for citizenship, the elders have another thing in common. They were all experiencing hunger. Many of the men had been injured on jobs but received no workers' compensation because of their uh, citizenship status. The women were older, and the money they earned throughout their lives as laborers in fields, then as custodians in hotels, did not include retirement benefits. At one point towards the end of our conversation, I asked them pointedly, do you have any food at home? Hearing the question, one proud elderly man with a, with a chiseled chin and a pointed mustache simply buried his head in his hands and began to weep. His wife sat up next to him, straight in her Sunday dress. She said, occasionally we put food on the table. When we do, it's normally one meal a day. I'll make a plate of beans and a couple of tortillas. We're older, so we don't eat as much. The rest of the group that avoided eye contact with me when I asked that question, hoping that I wouldn't call them. But when the elderly woman spoke, they all listened intently and nodded in agreement as if she were speaking for all of them. When she finished, her husband raised his head, wiped his tears away, and looked directly at me and he said, remember us when you come into your kingdom. find a private place. I found a bathroom and closed the door and I wept uncontrollably. I kept thinking about a chant that my congregation sings. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. We sing it over and over again. And as many times as I've sung that song or read those words, I never have imagined myself living in a kingdom now. This man's comment flipped those words for me. After all, he was preparing to leave the discussion and go back to a place that, of isolation that many elderly in our nation experience daily, to a home with very little food. I, along with my commissioners, would return to our nice hotel. We would eat a nice meal, then to the halls of power in Washington to deliver our report. Remember us. The following day, we went back to the same community center. We were scheduled to hear nearly 10 hours of testimony from specific individuals invited to speak 
then from anyone who wanted to have their voice heard. A few hours in, we heard a story uh, told to us by a professor named Dr. Joe Sharkey. He told us about a public health worker that works with him, Linda, and her visits to homes in the colonias. If you're not familiar with the colonias on the Texas-Mexico border, it may be difficult for you to grasp their living conditions. These particular colonias on the, in West Texas sit on the far edges of the city, sprawling out into the middle of the desert. Often they don't have running water or electricity, much less paved roads. Homes in the colonias tend to be built by whatever people have on hand. It's not uncommon to see a one-room home made with one wall of corrugated metal, another plywood, and another rocks salvaged from the surrounding land. Property in the colonias is not owned by the resident, but owned by a landowner and leased by the resident. The landowner can come and take it anytime he chooses to do so. On one of Linda's visits, she met a woman named Maria. Maria lived in a colonia that occasionally had electricity. Linda met with her to see how she was doing. And after brief introductions, Linda asked her a survey of questions regarding the health and welfare of Maria's family. For her final question, she asked a similar one to one I've asked the day before. She said, Maria, do you have any food in your house? Hearing the question, Maria too lowered her head under the weight of shame and guilt and slowly guided Linda to a small area that served as her kitchen where she had a small refrigerator. When she opened up the door, there was only a little bag of chicken bones in the fridge. Puzzled, Linda asked Maria, why is there a bag of chicken bones in your fridge? She was choked down tears and Maria <laughs> responded, so that when my children open up the refrigerator door, they'll at least see that something is there. Surely we can do better than this. As a nation as wealthy as ours, the infrastructure that we've spent uh, centuries building, surely we can do better than this. Our commission was sent across the country to try to identify root causes of hunger and to find out what we can do as a nation to improve lives. What we discovered was not a surprise. For most people, their lack of access to food was a direct result of their lack of access to money. However, their lack of access to money was often contextual. For the people in the desert, it was their lack of citizenship that resulted in low wages, which kept them food insecure. I think I mentioned last time that I came that I'm a third generation preacher's kid, and so I can't help but quote scripture uh, when I give these speeches. I also think it's important for, for a white male from the Christian tradition who have oftentimes been purveyors of some of the worst things that have happened in our country for us to remind ourselves what we are instructed to remember. Most Christians are probably familiar with Jesus' teachings, for I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. This is the only apocalyptic scene in the Gospel of Matthew, and Jesus was painting a picture of a very different type of kingdom. Jesus the king had returned, and he was sitting on the podium this time. And this is the final hearing, where all the people were gathered. And Jesus begins to separate them, the sheep from the goats, the righteous from the accused. To the astonishment of the people gathered, the criterion for judgment was not confession of faith in Christ, Nothing was said of grace, justification, or the forgiveness of sins. Instead, what mattered was that whether or not a person had acted with love and cared for the needy. These acts were not just extra credit, but constitute the decisive criteria for judgment. Essentially, when people respond or fail to respond to human need, they are in fact responding or failing to respond to Christ. So the calling of the faithful is clear. Feed the hungry, and you will live. <coughs> Regretfully, we haven't lived up to it as a nation. We have over 40 million Americans that are considered food insecure and live in poverty. 13 million are children. Over 4.5 million are senior adults. 
and in the nation as wealthy as ours, every county in the country has reported food insecurity. We've scapegoated the poor to justify not living up to our calling. We have to scapegoat and push the poor out of our minds. In order to do so, we have to dehumanize them. We've worked hard to classify the poor as lazy, to divide them as deserving and undeserving. We've developed theologies of prosperity to lift those who are rich in order to demonize those who are poor. That's how it becomes morally defensible for some children to have an abundance of food while others have a bag of chicken bones in the refrigerator. We can just blame the parent for being lazy or an illegal. And we create the welfare queen. The welfare queen who lives off government programs drives a Cadillac, owns an iPhone and a big screen TV, all while eating lobster paid for by food stamps, funded by hardworking American taxpayers like me, who receive no such benefit from the overreaching federal government. We make the welfare queen emblematic of all people in poverty, and thus the welfare queen is completely undeserving of our compassion and is a construct of her own making. This justifies her, justifies us, casting her out as a scapegoat into the desert to die. But who are the hungry, really? People, people often experience hunger in our nation for a variety of reasons. It's primarily episodic, meaning that people who experience hunger may not experience it daily. More than likely, they experience it at the end of a pay period. The first and most prevalent reason is underemployment. Basically, many people who are experiencing hunger have jobs and are working, but their jobs don't pay enough to cover all their living expenses, even when they're putting together as many jobs as they possibly can to try to make ends meet. When we lived in San Antonio, our neighbors would often find minimum wage paying jobs in the hospitality industry, servicing restaurants and hotels, caterings and vacationers. They would supplement those jobs with additional jobs in fast food restaurants, convenience stores, or anything else they could find. Our neighbor, Josie, lived in a duplex next door. Her husband, her husband suffered from kidney disease and had to walk to a dialysis clinic each day a mile away. Josie was legally blind, so every morning a bus would arrive shortly before 5 a.m. and pick her up and take her to the lighthouse for the blind where she worked. She and her blind co-workers made army fatigues for the troops in Iraq. When her shift was over, she would catch the same bus and return home each evening after 6 p.m. On weekends, she would use her walking stick to make her way down to the end of the street to try to find some work sweeping floors at the local restaurants for extra cash. The second reason people experience hunger in our nation is directly tied to educational achievement. One of my coworkers, Doug, was mentoring a high school student early in his career as a social worker. The student, Michael, was achieving the goals that he and Doug set forth for the beginning of the school year until the latter part of the spring. At that point, Michael began to fail his courses. Doug was exasperated. He pulled Michael out of class and he said, why are you failing? And Michael responded as if Doug could be proud. He said, Doug, if I can fail just one course, then I'm guaranteed to go to summer school. And if I go to summer school, I'll at least get one meal a day this summer. Mm -hmm. Doug was stunned. His heart was broken. His student was literally trading his future for food. Hunger and education can quickly become a vicious cycle. A person needs to have an education in order to have the best chance of not living in poverty. But living in poverty is a detriment to getting an education. In fact, some of the most important predictors of high school graduation are reading at a third grade level, family poverty, family structure, and living in an impoverished neighborhood. Hunger often contributes to higher dropout rates, grade repetition, and special education. Simply put, you must graduate from high school and get an additional degree to get out of hunger and poverty in the 21st century. But being hungry and in poverty makes it much more difficult to graduate from high school and get that additional degree. There are always exceptions, 
But if you're not the exception, your chances of living in poverty and experiencing hunger increase dramatically with the lack of educational attainment. On top of all that, race plays a major role in the higher rates of hunger in our nation, exacerbating the list so far. People of color are almost twice as likely to experience hunger. Whether or not we want to admit it, we have not healed our wounds of racism. We've had our moments of triage as a nation, abolishing slavery and the civil rights movement, which were critical steps to slowing the hemorrhaging flow of racist hatred, bigotry, and indifference that have been pervasive throughout our history. But we've not taken steps towards healing as a nation. We do not honor our commitment to reparation or put together a truth and reconciliation commission. We've not integrated our neighborhoods, our congregations, or our social groups. As a result, we're still dealing with racist outbursts all over our country, and people in minority households still cope with hunger and poverty to a greater degree than those in white households. And then there are our seniors. Several of the years ago, prior to my grandparents' passing, they were living in their home in Spring Hill, Louisiana. My grandfather, a retired pastor, was, a, was beloved in the community, as was my grandmother. There, was, there were certainly two people that lived a faithful life according to Jesus' standards. But in this late stage in their lives, their mental health was deteriorating because of dementia. They would forget to do basic things, and unfortunately, eating was one of those things. One day during the appointment, their doctor, a friend of the family, figured out that they were regularly missing meals. Through conversations with them, he also found out that on occasion when they did remember to eat, they would drive to the Sonic for a corn dog. This was unnerving for our family to hear for three reasons. One, they were missing meals. Two, when they were eating, it was something without a high nutritional value. And three, they were driving. <laughs> What is alarming about this story is that my grandparents were the matriarch and patriarch of their small community. <clears throat> Yet they were still going hungry because of their decline in mental health. Fortunately for them, my family and my grandparents' church sprang into action when they heard about this and partnered with the Meals on Wheels program to create daily check-ins. Imagine what would have happened to them if they didn't have family close, health insurance, or a strong social network. We know that hunger is primarily a result of poverty, but there are exceptions. Mental and physical health, along with being elderly, are certainly some of them. These, of course, are not all the root causes of hunger, but they're some of the most prevalent. Naturally, we hear a lot about the person that does not take personal responsibility for themselves and is thus hungry and living in poverty. And this certainly is a problem, but much less of one than we've been led to believe. In my two decades of living and working in impoverished conditions, I can affirm that these folks do exist, but they are the exception in impoverished communities. What is consistent for people experiencing hunger is they're forced to make trade-offs each month. They're forced to decide whether to pay for their rent, their car payment, their electricity bill, or buy food. Food is often the one negotiable item. If people don't pay their electricity bill, their power is cut off. If they don't pay rent, they're kicked out of their home. But if they don't buy food, they'll just go hungry. Yes, not having food leads to less productivity at work and school. It increases mental health decline and causes shame. But you keep your home, so people make trade-offs to get by. But the good news is that there are a lot of great groups doing a lot of amazing things to address food insecurity here in your state and around the country. In my first year at the Texas Hunger Initiative, where I serve as executive director, we decided to identify pilot communities across the state of Texas to organize a response to address food insecurity. We identified over 4,000 organizations in Texas doing something to address hunger, but we still had 5.5 million people that were considered food insecure. Many of the organizations I visited told me of their desires to partner with other groups, but the needs were so overwhelming that they were addressing every day that they didn't have the time to simply network with other organizations. This resulted in duplicated efforts and 
gaps of services that no one was aware of. As a part of our effort to build collaboration, my friends at USDA, the food banks, Texas state agencies, and Texas congregations would travel with me around the state to hold town halls, announcing our vision for a hunger-free state. We began galvanizing communities across sectors and nonprofits, churches, businesses, school districts, and local governments all came together to address hunger in their communities. These town halls were successful, and we quickly identified several pilot communities to try out this collaborative model. After we identified our pilot communities, we got a phone call midway through that year. I received a phone call from two women from Southland Baptist Church in San Angelo, Texas, Mary and Carol. I knew of the church because my father-in-law had pastored there 25 years ago, and I met Mary and Carol when my wife and I had visited San Angelo. On the phone that morning, they spoke with a sense of earnestness and urgency. Jeremy, three of our San Angelo manufacturing plants have just closed. So many people have lost their jobs. So we know that many kids in San Angelo are going hungry. We know it's especially going to be bad this summer when school's out. Oh, Mary, well, I'm sorry to hear that. How can we help? She said, we heard about PHI and we wanted to become one of your pilot communities. And I had to tell her, unfortunately, we've already chosen our pilot communities and we had a small staff at the time. I said, so why don't you call us back in a year and maybe we can assist you then. Well, if you've ever met a woman from West Texas, you know that <laughs> no does not come easily. <laughs> My answer didn't work with them. So, and they wouldn't hang up the phone. So I knew that if I was gonna get them off the phone, I was gonna to have to come up with an alternative plan. When I told them no first time, they decided that I didn't hear them. <laughs> so they spoke with even more urgency, and this time sprinkled with a bit of hostility. <laughs> they said, Jeremy, three of our plants closed, and our kids are going hungry. We need to be a pilot community as if I didn't fully comprehend what they said the first time. <laughs> I realized that this wasn't going to be as simple as hanging up the phone and, and talking to them again in a year. They were clearly persistent, and so I asked them to complete a community assessment. The assessment is one that typically takes us quite a while. The professionals on our team that are researchers just worked with Hunger Free Co Oklahoma. Two of the representatives are here. It took about a year. And the assessment after it was completed was well over 100 pages in length. My assumption was that Mary and Carol would either be overwhelmed with the amount of work that, uh, that, we, that I gave them or simply go on their way and maybe call me back next year. Mary said, thanks, Jeremy. And then Carol chimed in, we'll call you back soon. Three weeks later, <laughs> three weeks later, they put our researchers to shame. They called me back. Mary informed me they had completed their assessment and plainly asked, so can we be a pilot community now? I laughed in sheer amazement, called my friend at USDA, and I said, I think they already are. Mary and Carol identified that there were 10,000 children now on their free and reduced lunch program in their community of Tom Green County. The community had only provided 1,000 total meals in the summer of 2009. And so they knew that children were going to go to bed hungry in the summer of 2010. Needless to say, we arranged for our group to travel to San Angelo. When we had arrived, they had, they had convened the school district superintendent and school board members, city council officials and the mayor, church leaders, nonprofit directors, the business community, a congressman's office, and concerned citizens. These people were from different political parties, they were from different religious affiliations, and they were ready to get to work for the children of Tom Green County. After all, after our town hall, the community met weekly over the next several months to plan for the upcoming summer. They knew that each had something to offer to develop the strategy. One group would cook the meals, another one would deliver them to the site, then another group would host the site, yet another would provide activities to encourage children and families to come. In the summer of 2010, Tom Green County served nearly 20,000 meals to children, a model we've since replicated across the state, resulting in hundreds of millions of additional meals 
for children and their families. Now, Mary and Carol were somewhat unusual in their tenacity. These two women have spent much of their life at San Angelo, cultivating trust by advocating for those left on the margins. So when they called community leaders to tell them about the food insecurity epi epidemic among their children, they were all willing to listen and respond with the same sense of urgency that I heard over the phone on that initial call. West Texans have a <coughs> saying about reliability. You can hang your hat on that. Well, Mary and Carol were as reliable as, you, as they come. They also were wise enough to know that one church, one school, one business, or nonprofit could not meet the needs of so many food insecure <laughs> children. They knew that their strength would only come if the community worked together. They learned that sustainable social change happens by cultivating trust, collaborating across denominational and political lines, and committing themselves to the hungry and poor. I believe that these hunger-free community coalitions, like the one in San Angelo, are critical to cultivating trust and finding common ground in communities that can lead to transformative change. At THI, we've created a toolkit to support communities doing that very thing. We ourselves support 15 coalitions representing 60% of the population in Texas and have trained communities across the country to implement the model of engagement. The language for hunger-free communities was developed and popularized by the Alliance to End Hunger in Washington. They currently support a network of hunger-free communities across the country of which we participate. So how do we create and sustain a local a coalition to end hunger and point towards the larger problem of poverty? I want to do with my best Marco Rubio imitation. <laughs> Ideally, you do these in order. I certainly didn't initially. But step one is you recruit participants. I was recently visiting a small hill country town, Burnett, Texas, home to the Texas Hill Country's favorite storms, burgers, and shakes. I met with the coalition that has been active for the past several years there, addressing needs all over their rural county. It began with volunteers from one church that saw a need for a collaborative action to address hunger. Volunteers initially identified 24 different entities to approach to set up one-on-one -on -one meetings to learn about the organizations, their interests, goals, and above all, to build relationships. The result of this outreach was dramatic. Every single organization participated in the first meeting in the coalition. Then, these attendees helped spread the word to other interested organizations around the county. Now, 75 organizations have since become invested contributed in various ways to support this rural coalition in the Hill Country. The result has been the establishment of the Burnett County Hunger Alliance, which is an active coalition of food pantries, congregations, school administrators, elected officials, businesses, and other leaders who have committed to ending hunger in Burnett, Texas. When you're creating your coalition, you need to consider how to engage and involve people who have personally experienced food insecurity. This is something that Kathy and I have talked about at length um, and, and with our sister organizations around the country. When you incorporate community members affected by food insecurity, it gives you a built-in reality check. It adds credibility to your effort and it makes sure that your, your commitment is uh, committed, you are committed essentially as an organization to a participatory process. I tell my team all the time, if you neglect this step, you'll build a boat that can't float. The second step is to establish a coalition structure. Now this is getting technical. But the South Plains Hunger Solutions uh, uh, Coalition, which is in the Lubbock and Amarillo area, organized their coalition structure with a steering committee that met quarterly and three action teams that met monthly. The action teams were, were focused on child hunger, senior hunger, and hunger and horticulture. Each team had a co-chair and a chair that served on the steering committee, serving as the connector between the action teams and the steering committees. The 
coalition hosts an annual summit organized by the steering committee where the action teams update the community on prior projects that they've identified and strategies being used to address them and subsequent progress. So it is ideal for a coalition to have a staff person from an organization committed to serve as the backbone for the coalition. This staff person serves as the coalition coordinator, providing some of the core logistical administrative tasks needed to maintain an active coalition and support the involvement of community leaders. We would all not be here today if it were not for the backbone work of the work of Hunger Free Colorado. The tireless efforts that the staff have made just to put on this event are a part of the process, so if you can imagine doing this county by county throughout the state. Community assessments are also a critical part of, an organ, of organizing communities for change because they can help develop a deeper understanding of the community's strengths, needs, culture, history, social structure, and conflict. So planning for action is our third step. Simply put, you want to identify what each organization is doing and where they're doing it and what gaps, if any, exist in the community. The report will likely highlight more areas of concern than your coalition should take on immediately. Once the report is finalized and shared, the coalition will determine priority areas, develop action teams focused on each priority area, and write a strategic plan outlining the steps that you will take to achieve your goals. The important part of this being a community participatory process is that you co-own the assessment that you've created. So you're all in it. Everybody gets to be a leader in their respective space. The fourth step, which people oftentimes want to jump to the first step, is to take action. Early in 2009, the CEO of one of Indianapolis's leading nonprofits realized the impact of the recession was going to create a tsunami of people in need and contacted the mayor's office to come up with a plan. They immediately began to call interested parties, which led to the creation of the Indy Hunger Network. The network took action and identified 150 congregations, charities, and schools to offer the summer meal program, creating an increase of 25% more meals served to children during summer months. The fifth step, and the final step, is to assess the progress. Our coalition in Dallas, which is our largest and serves over 400 member organizations, realized that the enthusiasm of the initial years of the coalition had worn off. And so they began to assess and reassess how they could be more participatory in their engagement strategy. So they realigned, they reconfigured their action teams to, spoke, to focus on areas that the community had identified as their key needs. The results was, were a reorganized, re-energized coalition that engaged leaders and participants in the coalition that led to success in each area. When a hunger-free community coalition strategy is paired with federal resources, it can become a powerful tool for social change. The model can also be easily adapted to other larger issues of poverty, human trafficking, homelessness, or other pertinent local issues on a national, state, or local level. When we paired our hunger-free community coalition model with child hunger in Texas, we were able to increase breakfast for kids by 354 million breakfasts over the past five years. We've also been able to increase uh, 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 meals for children by 100 million additional meals on an annual basis since 2011. Finally, we were able to increase staff participation by 15% and in a climate like Texas, that was quite a feat. This could not have happened by, with our small team by itself. This happened because of thousands of organizations came together to create public and private partnerships to develop and implement strategic plans for food justice in their communities. Well, I'll leave you with this. Social change is often written and talked about in retrospect like poetry. It's often seen as a spontaneous eruption of passion sprung forth on the world that the power structures simply cannot contain. Our idea of social change is similar to the Big Bang Theory of the universe's origins. A few random and unplanned actions occur that set off a historical chain reaction. We often remember the story of Rosa Parks as an example of this type of revisionist history. It's widely taught in history classes that Rosa Parks 
was a tired woman that had worked all day and had walked a long way to the bus stop. When she arrived at the bus, there was only one seat available, but it was in the whites only section. Rosa, tired from a hard day's labor, sat down exhausted in the one available seat. This naturally caused outrage on the bus, and the bus driver refused to leave the bus stop until she got out of the seat. When she didn't, she was thrown out of the seat and off the bus and arrested. Shortly thereafter, as the narrative goes, Martin Luther King swoops in to save the day with a few marvelous speeches, one in front of the Lincoln Memorial, and civil rights legislation is mysteriously passed. What we hear, what we rarely hear about Rosa Parks is that she was actually in leadership in the Montgomery chapter of the NAACP. She was not sitting in the whites only section, but refused to give up her seat to a white man. And the bus boycott, due to someone being thrown off the bus and ultimately arrested, had long been planned and discussed by civil rights leaders. A deeper reading of history and social science tends to discount the myth of random unplanned action leading to significant social change. Instead, this action among others was strategically planned, thoughtfully carried out, and a careful dissemin dissemination strategy ensued afterwards. Likewise, creating hunger-free communities will take the same level of intentionality, strategy, and careful implementation. Hunger and poverty did not happen overnight, so we will not end them overnight or with a five-year campaign. But they can be overcome by recognizing that we all have gifts to share, but none of us can tackle hunger alone. We can win by working together, by cultivating mutual trust, by finding common ground and committing our lives to the cause of those experiencing hunger and poverty. After all, our economic hardships are not evenly spread out among society. Rather, it is the same family struggling with bouts of hunger that also does not have affordable health care. It is the same family sending their children to schools where graduation rates are well below 50% and college readiness is in the single digits. It is the same family that have lacked livable wage paying jobs for generations. They are our scapegoats and we've sent them to live in deserted urban neighborhoods and rural trailer parks that we avoided. But this practice is antithetical to who we are as a people. It's antithetical to the scripture that I read in Matthew. After all, the accused in Matthew are those that did not see the hungry and give them food. The ones that did not provide for the stranger or clothing for the naked. Instead, Matthew calls us not only to see the hungry as humans, but to see the hungry as Jesus. But we're not meant to walk this path alone. Mary and Carol knew that they needed each other and their community to walk beside them. Rosa Parks must have realized this when she was thrown off the bus and arrested. Susan B. Anthony, Dr. King, and Nelson Mandela must have known in their brief times on the mountaintop that the saints of history were walking with them. And today, they're walking with us. So together, We repent of our collective scapegoating, our indifference, our lack of trust in God when we too are in deserted places. Together, we remember our brothers and sisters in poverty who live as strangers in our kingdoms. And together, we'll put flesh on the words of Jesus. For I was hungry. Prophet Jeremiah. <laughs> Not cool, Mom and Dad. I'm going to take some time for some QA. Yes? Any thoughts on the softball? Oh, good, thank you. We will set the table.
attitude, how do you change the mindset that is expressed? Excuse me, that is expressed in the political leadership that you noted that assumes that the failing is amongst those who are hungry, as opposed to a different national story in which we begin to recognize shared societal and cultural goals that lift everybody up. How do you make that change? How do we get there? Yeah. I, I, you know, I don't think that's a softball at all. So thank you. No, good question. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, so next question. <laughs> good one. Um, I, you know, I, I, uh, I just finished a, a book project and I'm hoping that more than just my mother buys it. But, uh, uh, but, but in it, I talk a lot about shaming power versus sharing power. So as a tendency, we in the justice community think, oh, if people are acting unjustly, we're going to shame them into acting justly. And can you imagine those of you who are married in the room going to a marriage counselor and sitting down with a therapist and your therapist saying, you know, if you want to get your spouse to do what you need them to do, you just need to shame them publicly. <laughs> would we ever think that that would work? No. So why in the world do we think in the justice community that if we shame our politicians publicly, that that is going to move them towards justice? It never, ever works. The people, many of the people that are purveyors of injustice and this racist outburst that we're seeing across the nation are people whose parents and grandparents were opposed to the civil rights movement violently. We didn't change their hearts and minds. We changed legislation, which was critical. We had to do that. But we didn't change their hearts and minds. And as a result, three generations later, we're still dealing with systemic racism and really have made no headway in many respects. In fact, our schools are more segregated now than they have been since uh, Brown versus Board of Education. So I think finding a shared power is critical. It's slow. It means cultivating trust with somebody that you probably vehemently disagree with. I'll give one example. Uh, there's an elected official in Washington, the first time I sat down with him 10 years ago. I was telling him about food security or food insecurity in one of our border towns. And his response to me was, they should all just move. He said, we have plenty of, plenty of jobs in our district. And so if they're really hungry, they'll just leave. So that was my baseline. I was like, okay, there we are. And uh, um, kind of puts that shared power idea to, to the test. But over 10 years, we've cultivated a relationship with him. We didn't demonize him for his statement. We had to, we really tried to understand where he was coming from. And he was right. There are a lot of jobs in his district. And so if there was a way that we could uh, give people opportunities in his district to be able to support their families back home, much like our undocumented immigrants are doing, you know, uh, as they're supporting families in Central America right now. Maybe, maybe we could adopt the same kind of model, but ultimately we built a relationship with them. And over 10 years, it's taken some time. But he called me up after he, he went on a visit, uh, some home visits with our staff in West Texas and with the food bank staff. And he met with an elderly couple. And the elderly couple had been teachers. They'd done everything right by this congressman. And, uh, but they were experiencing food insecurity because, uh, because of the economic boom in this congressman's area. Uh, tax, you know, tax, property tax, everything was skyrocketing, and they couldn't afford food. And it broke his heart, and it completely opened him up to a whole new world of realizing. And so now I wouldn't call him, you know, he's not going to be the next Jim McGovern per se, but he is taking some steps toward recognizing that food insecurity and poverty were much more complex than he had originally thought. And so it's finding that area where you can find common ground, and it's beginning to work there. And so if you know that, if you've ever sat down with a financial planner and they, they, you have credit cards to pay off, they always tell you to pay off the one with the lowest balance first, which never made sense to me. I was thinking, why would you want to pay off the one with the highest interest rate first? But they told me, they said, well, no, you need to know that you can do it, right? And likewise for us, we need to find these, these areas of, of common interest that we can, where we can begin to expand our communities towards justice, but recognize that this is a lifetime issue. You know, you look at major social change issues throughout the course of human history, and they did not end overnight. It took people 
uh, concerted effort, and most of our leaders gave their lives for the cause. I told the group last night about William Wilberforce, who committed his whole life to the cause of ending the British slave trade. He passed, they passed the British slave trade in Parliament three days before he died. Dr. King, you know, God, if you think about all these major social change agents, and they died giving their life to the cause. So I think for you, what it's going to mean is if you want, if you're thinking about this for the next generation and the generation after them, you're going to have to be able to build relationships. Uh, you're going to have to cultivate mutual trust and find common ground. Otherwise, we might advance policy only to the detriment of the next generation because they're going to be dealing uh, with the kinds of outbursts that we're dealing with now uh, because we didn't change the hearts and minds of the generation. Much longer answer than you probably want. <laughs> Other questions? Yes. Is there a way we can get a copy of these sheets if we wipe it away here so that I can write? I'm going to go off. But <laughs> I would like to have a copy yeah. of that. Sure, sure. Yeah, I can make it yeah. 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 yeah, absolutely. Or you can buy my books on the <laughs> Support DHI. So here's the deal. So though I admire Kathy, and though we do, uh, we have plagiarized all the stuff that Hunter Free Colorado has been doing uh, for years. <laughs> we're also a little jealous. You know, our friends at Hunter Free Oklahoma are having the same amount of success that y'all are having. And uh, we're like, wait a second, y'all got to slow your roll a little bit. You're <laughs> making us look bad. So, uh, uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that's one way that you can get your feedback from. <laughs> Other questions? policies that's directed at taking away SNAP or maybe access to quality health care. And it seems to be an vicious cycle that we're not really being good stewards to help those who have fallen low on their luck. And so I'm wondering what kinds of thoughts and ideas that you have to help break the cycle so that we're focusing on those to break that cycle of hunger and poverty. I'm glad that an elected official is asking that question as well. I mean, that's important. Uh, I wish we could, wish you could teach my legislators down in Texas to ask those kinds of questions. <laughs> well, that's why I call them scapegoats. I mean, for all practical purposes, it's the same family that's holding, uh, uh, that's bearing the weight of all of our systemic injustice for 400 years, right? Um, the reason that we're able to live the life that we live in part is because we have created systemic injustice and it's all targeted at one family. So it's not, oftentimes, you know, we're all specialists at Hunter, right? So we can all rattle off the 15 fellow nutrition programs and probably tell you exactly how many food insecure people you have in your county and so forth, right? We can probably tell everybody how much money we left on the table in SNAP last year or how many kids didn't get served during summer meals. We know hunger. But the family that is experiencing hunger on the local level is experiencing every major issue that, 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 are, that is a societal injustice in our country. So they are likely moving from home to home without, a, without um, housing security, as some people would call it. They are living, they are working in low-wage paying jobs, and they are dealing with societal injustice. So it's not, you know, so we're, we're one part, of, we're an important part of the puzzle, right? Because we know that they need food. We know that the kids cannot thrive in schools if they don't have access to three healthy meals a day. One of my good friends. Is the, is the chief obesity researcher for children in the country, uh, well, Dr. Schwartz. And she told me, she said, Jeremy, I was setting out to prove that our child and nutrition programs, that we had to focus on nutrition for our kids, and that was the most important thing that we should focus on with our school meal program. And she said, that is important. But she said, the number one reason for, for children uh, having diet-related disease in impoverished communities is not because of the nutrition quality of their meals, it's because they don't have consistent access to food. She said, so when they do have access to food, they're gorging. One of our principals calls Mondays, throw up Mondays. And they have extra custodians on, back, on, on hand on, on, on Mondays because, because when kids get to their school breakfast program, they're gorging because they haven't eaten over the weekend. And so it, it ensues to, you know, 
vomiting and diarrhea. So I think that one, we've got to tell us the narrative. Another thing I think, given the contention that we're experiencing on a, on a national level right now, you know, I'm in, I'm in Washington almost every month. Uh, we're deeply involved uh, in the political conversation around the Farm Bill, around all things child and nutrition related. But uh, um, I really do think a hyper-local strategy is a good strategy right now. Being invested um, in local communities, if you go to a congregation, that's a captive audience, right? And a con congregations can be powerful tools to reframe the imagination for why we are our brother and sister's keeper, right? So I think those are some important steps, um, but also recognize that it's gonna take time. We, we cannot let up, but it is gonna take time. It's gonna take concerted effort. So I think if we do that, you know, we can ultimately, you know, see that, that arc bend towards justice. I think one of the things my, uh, thank you for your, your talk, by the way. I think one of the things my organization's been watching very closely is the public charge proposed rule. And so I just wonder, you mentioned the, the change, sorry. You mentioned the, um, the uptake in SNAP and um, how that program has um, gotten better, but I just wonder how your communities are preparing for what may be a significant change in public rule termination, yep. uh, or excuse me, public charge determination. Um, so I'd love to hear about some of those uh, proactive initiatives. Yeah. Uh, so last week I was with uh, uh, Joaquin Castro, a congressman from San Antonio, who <clears throat> hosted me at the, the Congressional Hispanic Caucus uh, Institute, their, their big conference in Washington. And, and that was one of the major themes of the conversation. You know, what's coming in the public charge? Because first of all, we don't know, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we, we have no idea what's going to be in there. We can assume it won't be good, you know, based on the other kinds of things we've seen. So I think that, uh, so for us, part of it is working with organizations that are trusted organizations with families on the, on the local community. So I'll give you an example. Arise is a community that works with a, a group of colonias um, outside of McAllen, Texas, so the Rio Grande Valley. Arise is made up and run by a document um, and, and works for undocumented immigrants. When uh, this past administration, we actually took the entire uh, White House delegation down to, uh, to this old, this dusty yard that served as a summer meal site where they would do Zumba classes for the adults and all kinds of fun stuff that, uh, that Arise would host. But that organization and the sisters uh, of charity that work with that organization are, um, are beloved and respected and trusted in and so it's really navigating you know, those relationships to make sure that, that community residents know it's safe for their kids to uh, go to a summer meal site or after school meal program or even to send them to school, uh, which a lot of people are concerned about. Unfortunately, you know, it, it, we've seen a decline in SNAP participations because of, of the immigration scare. And uh, a lot of our families are scared to go to the grocery store because they're afraid they're gonna be picked up by ICE or the Border Patrol. So, um, and they were in many communities where you didn't have trusted organizations like Arise. Um, they didn't send their kids to summer meal sites. And so um, there is a lot of fear right now. Um, and you know, Texas is, um, uh, is, a, is a huge state with a lot of undocumented. It has a growing population you know, here in, in, uh, in the Denver and, and area as well. So um, I think we're just seeing widespread trust brand. So I mean, if you have relationships, I think it's calming them, but it's also, to reframe the narrative, we're supposed to welcome the stranger, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, so one of the things that we're also doing, as I was in Guatemala two weeks ago, and it's beginning to say, okay, you know, we, we have hundreds of thousands of children uh, come to South Texas every year who are migrating specifically from Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador because of the violence that, that, that's happening there. Violence um, largely by gangs that were started in Los Angeles and then we deported them up. And we traded, we, if y'all don't mind, I don't wanna get too wonky for you for a second, but we changed the way that we fight the drug war. And so we really beefed up uh, resources for the Coast Guard and so drugs stopped coming across the water and they started coming across the Central American, uh, Central American um, um, countries. And so that led to, coupled with the fact that we were deporting all these gangs, uh, that led to the widespread outbreak of violence in these communities. 
But when I was sitting there here to say, okay, what are the conditions here and what can we do to become a resource to countries like Guatemala and El Salvador and Honduras? We know what it takes to build a nation. We have a long way to go in terms of building equity in our nation, but we know what it takes to build infrastructure. What can we do to partner with those countries so that they can be safe, so that families don't split themselves apart and send their children into the U.S. because they're worried that their kids are going to be recruited into gangs. One of my coworkers is a forensic anthropologist, and part of her job on behalf of the state is to identify the remains of children who die in the desert when they are immigrating here, and to connect the, the, those, those uh, dead children with their families back home. I thought, we need her to have a new research agenda, right? But the only way we can do that is to go downstream. Uh, we can't just continue to address the issue here. So. It's a, it's a huge, complicated issue um, when you're talking about immigration in the U.S. Um, most immigrants, actually, undocumented immigrants, actually come north of the border. They don't come south of the border. Something that we also don't talk about. Um, but, uh, but I'm glad that you're being attentive to it, and we'll all be attentive to the public charge. Just hope it doesn't happen. in a fluent community of the nuances or complexities of hunger. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's a great question. Well, I will say, so we do have a toolkit, and it will be made available online, a hunger-free community toolkit. If, if you find that of value to you, it really goes into depth. Um, it was co-written by a number of our regional directors. We have eight regional staff members, or eight regional offices around the state that facilitate organizing on the local level, just because Texas is so large. And uh, one, one little quote on that note is uh, uh, Brian Stevenson, who wrote uh, the book Just Mercy, uh, has a quote essentially, um, I'll, I'll paraphrase it, but essentially he says, you can't solve a social problem from a distance. You have to immerse yourself in the issue. And so uh, the civil rights era, they would talk about uh, incarnational organizing, where you lived among the people that you're working with. And that was very formational for me. So I do think you know, having that, that presence, that constant presence in the community that you're working in, is important because what happens after five o'clock and on the weekends is really where life happens, right? But I, but but I hope the toolkit can be a resource to you. But also, it's um, it's starting with where people are and um, and beginning to reframe the issue and introduce them. You know, you can use anecdotal evidence if you have experiences or know people that have experiences living in poor neighborhoods for 20 years. We've got loads of stories um, to tell, and uh, but then also paired with great. Uh, I know your state just came out with a blueprint uh, um, for, to end hunger in Colorado, which has a whole host of statistics. So those that are, are quantitative minded, you know, you've got statistics and resources to be able to address. Those that are looking for economic opportunity, this is what I tell our mayors. Um, I recently just said this to our mayor. So we left in, in Waco, little, little town Waco. We left $55 million on the table in four of our federal nutrition programs. Four of the 50, $55 million in a small town. Well, I asked him, I said, do you have, I asked him and our city manager, I said, do you have any economic development program for our city that's at large? Well, of course, I know the answer is they don't, right? But I said, well, you know, you're working hard on these $250,000 grants, which is great, you know, and, and we certainly need you to focus on those. But don't you think we should do, do more to try to leverage these $55 million worth of resources to our community? Three of those programs are around our school districts. My son. Uh, my, my sons, um, uh, you know, I, I, I have three boys, and, as, and having three, boy, three white boys, it's been important for us that they be in a minority context. So they've always lived, they've always been a minority in the neighborhoods they've lived in. They're a minority in the school districts where they go. My oldest son runs track, not well, but he runs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and so I hope he doesn't get a report from that statement. But uh, he's a teenager now, so that will not go. <laughs> takes himself very seriously. But, uh, but we have all of the surrounding school districts are almost 100% free and reduced lunch rate. But we were not serving meals after school to our kids. And so our kids would leave to go to these track meets at like 3.30 in the afternoon, not get home till 10 or 11 at night with no food since lunch. I'm like, we're putting our name, our city name on their chest 
Are we representing them well as they are representing us? Well, no. You know, fortunately, we got a new superintendent that wants to do something about it. But those are resources. Those resources not only provide meals to kids, they create jobs. So if somebody comes at you and they say, well, people just need to work their way out of poverty, great, I've got a solution for you. Let's make sure we're maximizing these programs because they create jobs in the community. Imagine how many cafeteria workers are gonna have jobs now that we're providing three meals a day to the kids in our district. We left $35 million on the table and snacks. One of the grocery chains we work with told us that that, that program uh, accounts for one in 10 of every job they have in their store. So, care about jobs? Want people to work themselves out of poverty? Great. Let's sign everybody up for SNAP. That'll create a lot of economic opportunity for people. I call it trickle up economics with my economist friends because that makes them angry. <laughs> so you're investing in citizens. Actually, it's economic theory that works. You're investing in the poorest people in your community who, in turn, reinvested immediately into grocery stores, and that money trickles up to the owners of the company. So, um, so they might get mad. But that's what we're doing. Cafeteria. So. Other thoughts and questions. I sufficiently answered all of your questions in that time period, then, uh, then my staff owes me, oh, oh okay, I was going to say my staff owes me a big cup of coffee. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> Not only for better mills, but to really close the achievement gap because lack of education is going to contribute to not being able to be employed in the future, um, whether that child is on a college track or a career track, but not being able to perform it. So they're not eating well, they're not going to perform in school well, and then they're also going to be marginalized and usually targeted by the school's discipline and policy. So I just was wondering how important do you think it is to partner with coalitions who are specifically working in that area. Yeah. Well, uh, we did a, a research uh, project. Being a university project, we have to do research on everything. So if we want to leave at 4.30 on a Friday afternoon, we, got, we have to do a, a randomized control trial of what it means to build an if that's a research jargon. But basically, <laughs> we did a big research project with Dallas Independent School District specifically looking at this issue and Little Rock Independent School District. What we found is that when kids have access breakfast and lunch and at school meals, it increases academic performance, particularly in science and math. It also decreased discipline problems. It decreased diet-related disease because of higher nutritional intake that the kids were getting. Uh, you name it, it had all kinds of positive ramifications. So again, if we care about educational attainment of our children in our schools, then every school district in the state particularly those that have high poverty, that are high poverty districts, need to ensure that our kids are getting three meals a day, five days a week, while they're in their care. Now with the community adult food care program, you can also do Saturday meals. You can provide meals. Uh, one of our districts, uh, Dallas Independent District, now does 350,000 meals a day for their kids. They keep their, they keep their, their schools open during spring break and, some, uh, uh, and during Christmas break to continue to serve meals. Um, funded through that program because they know kids aren't going to eat just because they're out of school. So uh, you got to do it. It's a non-negotiable. And if, if, if superintendents or, or, or teachers push back um, to say, you know, sorry, it's 21st century. This is a new reality. I'm sorry that educate. I'm sorry that you're having to bear the weight of a lot of our societal injustice in your schools. We know that it's overwhelming, but this is going to set your kids up for success, which ultimately sets them up for success. I'm a little softer when I actually talk to you. <laughs> I'm going to ask a similar question, but from more of a 30,000 foot viewpoint. Uh, you've alluded to uh, that uh, hunger doesn't happen in a vacuum. Uh, there's poor health care, there's poor housing, there's right. uh, lack of access to our democratic processes, etc. Uh, this room is full of people who are committed to nutrition access and, and every facet of that. What do you recommend for coalition building from that 30,000 foot? Because the housing people will certainly support us nutrition folks who will support access to democratic processes, who will, et cetera, et cetera. Where, where do we look to build that larger coalition that will assure its success across the board for all the people that we're serving? Yeah, well, that's a good question. 
you know, in Texas, one of the reasons that we started with Humber, we're really a poverty people. My background is in poverty until I started doing THI work 10 years ago. Um, but I also know that if I'm going into a conservative context and trying to organize a community around poverty, I'll get labeled a socialist, and that's as far as I get. In fact, we won't do anything. But historically, and you still see this on the local level, hunger is a bipartisan issue, in part because you have congregations serving as food pantries and all kinds of things. So, um, so hunger is a good place to start. But I also think it requires a level of humility on our part, right? We say, okay, hunger is very important. And I do believe hunger and poverty are, are our social issues of the day that we're gonna be judged by, just like we judge the civil rights uh, generation on whether or not they were for or against civil rights. I think it's of critical importance. But if we can humble ourselves with our peers who are working also on poverty-related issues to say, we know we're doing one, we're, do, we're doing, we're dealing with one aspect of family poverty. You're dealing with another aspect of family poverty. How can we work collaboratively together to ensure that we're trying to right an injustice? And so I think, uh, so the, the coalition model that we've built uh, we built with the intent of it being referable to other poverty-related issues, and so it could easily be the same format. It's the same kind of fill in the bank blank process, essentially. Uh, if you wanted to have a poverty coalition, like a poverty-free coalition, maybe instead of a hunger-free coalition, so that you can get wider support. That may really work, particularly in your rural communities where you don't have a plethora of organizations um, that are all specialists in each given area. Well, I'm out of time. I'll leave you with this. So, as I mentioned well before, so I, I mentioned this to the group last night. That, so the thing that was important about Will of course, one of his biographers pointed out, he said it was important, obviously, that he ended the British slave trade, but the most important thing that he did was he ended the idea that slavery was an acceptable form of commerce. Because until that day, slavery was widely acceptable as an economic condition. And I think our challenge for, our, for all of us sitting in the room today, is to end the idea that hunger and poverty are acceptable socioeconomic conditions. That's our task that we have to commit our lives to. And if we do, then hopefully our children and grandchildren will be able to tackle different issues. And hopefully we'll begin to right some injustices that have needed to be righted for a long time. So thanks for being with us.